Hello and welcome to part five of five. The what might have been and a few other things. So, what might have been if the Germans hadn't won in Norway? Well, let's consider what are the options which could have stopped them. First opportunity, German fleet surprised at sea. There are multiple points. We go right the way back to the beginning where that could have happened. Let's see. Landing now uh, 9th of April. We can go back even further. 6th of April. All these are potential options, but they don't happen. Luck, judgment, whatever you want to call it. My own personal view is if the Norwegians had... See, if the British had surprised the Germans at sea and defeated their attacking forces at sea, or at least a large chunk of them, then the Germans might have called off the operation, but I doubt the Norwegians would have done anything other than to remain neutral. Because, yes, it would have made them worried about the Germans, but they don't want to get into a war. They would have been upset, but I don't think they'd other thing. They also might not believe the British when the British are saying that these forces were aimed for you. Second option, British forces turn up right after the Germans landed. I.e., let's say the battle of the, uh, the Second Battle of Narvik, there is a far larger Royal Navy force going in, and Whitworth does what he wanted to do after third, thought about doing after the Third Battle of Narvik, which was land straight into Narvik. Well, at that point, the Germans have landed and your heroes. And it also shakes up the Germans because the Germans, if they have points which they're already losing, if they've lost Narvik, if they lose Trondheim quite quickly, and those are the places where you're more likely to have this, then the Norwegians can concentrate on bringing forces south, the Allies can send forces south, and it turns into a fight in the centre of Norway. And if you've got the Norwegians holding on more, you have far more a problem. I also have a feeling that something nasty probably happens to Quislink, but... Hmm. Third, rather than abandoning Norway due to invasion of France, the Allies redouble their efforts and force Germany into a two-front fight. This is a particularly interesting one, and I don't consider it a very good outcome for Norway. It turns Norway into a battleground, and whilst... The Germans really couldn't use their armour, and let's be honest, the armour they're sending is that! Anubis for sank, uh, frankly. Um, yeah, no. That's just not going to actually get anywhere. But in both options two and three, you could have an interesting outcome. But I'll explain that more in a second. There is another option. After the Denmark's invaded, Norway does an immediately rapid mobilization. Instead of they shout out by radio, with the invasion of Denmark, we are going to high alert all personnel Get to your garrisons immediately, arm and prepare for war. Mili goes out by radio around the whole country. Now, yes, the Germans will be coming in that night. Or later that day. But if you've got an immediate radio going out, you don't have things like the colonel at Narvik being half asleep and his garrison being in their beds and all this thing. You have the troops, any troops that are there, and probably more troops coming in on full alert. You have things like General Theisha will probably have come back to his command and try and get back there earlier. You have, hopefully before the heavy weapon hit, so he's in post. 
you can have your own forces organised. Oslo would be properly defended. Where they are defended, they do things like sinking Blucher and damaging ships. They do a really good job when they're actually in position. So it's just a case of they have to be in position. And they do have to be in position. There's nothing wrong with that. This would be a central thing. And here's the point. Denmark is a warning sign. And... I have to add a codicil because actually I had a conversation with my girlfriend about this one because I was pointing out that Denmark really ha is not doesn't have anything at this period which is so strategically important as to justify invading it. The only thing it does have is its position. It is a crossroads point. You can get to Scandinavia from there. You can block the bar. Uh, you can block the Balt uh, the Baltic. You can. Uh, uh, Baltic, you can sort of do all sorts of things getting control of Denmark. Denmark itself isn't a prize, it's what Denmark strategically gives you. The only thing, as my girlfriend pointed out, was that I might consider worth invading Denmark for is Danish pastries, but that's they're good, but they're not worth going to involve a war for, they're not worth invading. So, the moment Denmark is invaded, that tells you that's not where the Germans are stopping because there is no reason to invade Denmark if it's a neutral country. Yes, the Anglo-German naval treaty had basically put them all on warning that they were going to they were no longer in a sort of peaceful state and they were at a crossroads where they were going to need armed forces. But that had been back in 1937. They hadn't done much. So Denmark was never really going to stand for long. Although their general does try and put up a fight, but the cabinet overrules him because they're worried about the damage done to their people. You know that again. Christian Lake, the commander of the Norwegian forces, is not that kind of general. So an interesting thing is if you could swap him round with the Danish general. So you had the troops prepared to fight in both ones, and a general prepared to fight, and a government which was sort of reluctantly prepared to fight, how much different the scenario would have been. But we'll leave that to one side. The fact is, if they had gone on alert then, if they had sent it out by radio the moment they're cabinet meeting, instead of this half-hearted mobilization they go through, I don't see how the Germans succeed. They have 8,000 troops. Yes, they'll probably get ashore in some places. But Narvik, Trondheim, they might well lose. Oslo, definitely lose. And if they don't get control of those areas then the war becomes a very different kettle of fish. So, let's say it's option two or three. Or even a version of option four with two or three added on. You could then have had a very interesting scenario. Let's say Narvik was secured. Quickly. And so, Fleischer comes south with his division to back up Carlton de Witt. And they are the two running the front. You have a very interesting scenario with those two pipe smoking, fairly aggressive, go find the enemy, where is he, let's, uh, let's attack now, approach. I don't think you end up likely with a two front war. I think you end up with the Germans getting losing Norway. Because I don't see the Germans wanting to give enough supplies to Norway for it to be a two front war when they want to take France. France is the prize. Knock France out of the war, you win the war. That's the theory that it goes. Norway's great for a long war, but they're not planning on a long war. They're planning on a short war. So I think if they're going to starve any front of supplies, it's going to be Norway. I do think that could be a problematic thing because I could see a second front being opened up in Denmark but after these two had finished with going through Norway but we'll leave that to one side that would have been a very interesting combination to have ma matched up anyway some of the coolest ships which have been mentioned Though it, Norway, I often point out, is a destroyer war. And the thing is, the Royal Navy has lots of destroyers involved. So you have HMS Vicious, Vicious Winchester, 
um, Whitehall and Akates. These are some of the destroyers available in 1940, which are critical to it. And roughly comparative, the C and D class, the Type 1934, the E and F class are roughly comparable. But you start to realize very quickly that there are a lot less German destroyers than there are British destroyers. And this is why the losses at Narvik, those 10 destroyers, are such a big thing. But also, this tells you something else when you start to go through all these options. The Germans could have lost a lot. Now, I haven't mentioned renown muchness, and that's because her part really comes after the loss of glowworm. And I could also get into loss of aircraft carriers, but I won't because that's a whole other thing. Renown is running a part of the group which HMS Glowworm. She was sort of in charge of the group. The glowworm was attached to it. Glowworm gets separated and gets, of course, sunk by Hippa. Hippa gets damaged, though and has to go back to be repaired. Anyway, Renown comes south like an avenging mother hen, and basically uh, it's looking out, and her destroyers are going up and down in rough seas and can't keep up with her, and they're having to draw back. And Renown is a rebuilt 90, uh, World War One era 15-inch armed battlecruiser being turned into a, an upgraded World War II is this sort of era-level battlecruiser by rebuilding. Comes across Scharnhorst and Eisenhower. Solo. And scares the bejesus out of them, and they decide to run away from her because she is just so pissed off that her that one of her destroyers got sunk. It, it's one of the things you have... It, I, I try and point out the Royal Navy is very much a family. They might not like you all each, uh, each other, but they this time they know each other. They're all part of each other. And we often treat the idea as the loss of hood and the great big hunt which emerges from it as something unusual. It's this thing. But actually, the loss of Glowworm far earlier resulted in Renown going on a vengeful hunt. She found finds Sharnhorse and Nisenau, and they decide that whilst they are two light battleships, and on paper, mm, should be able to match up against her, would actually prefer to be elsewhere. Anywhere elsewhere. Far away. She's got 15-inch guns, and she doesn't seem to understand the concept that we might be able to hit her. Plus, she's hitting us, and we're not hitting her because our systems have been damaged by the ways, whereas she's just blasting away merrily and hitting us. And then there's the performance of Whitworth and the tribal class and other destroyers, which go into the third Battle of Narvik, after a couple of their brethren have been sunk at the second Battle of Narvik. What is this reaction going on? This is the Royal Navy as it behaves. Now, why am I talking about this when I talk about Norway? Because Norway could have been secured. The fighting dominance the British achieved. We, we talk a lot about the German naval forces that being employed. But the fact is, if Scharnhorst and Eisenhower had come across when they'd been covering Group A1, had come into contact with Renown and Warspite, or even Renown on her own with her destroyer group, there is a significant chance that they would have stopped the attack. The Germans had so much, such restrictive rules of engagement, so they were supposed to be so careful about marshalling their forces, that frankly, any resistance, anything other than a clear shot and managing to avoid contact with the British Navy and the Royal Navy, would have probably stopped their attack. So, what else am I announcing today? Patron vote. What are the options for December 2020? The 79th anniversary attack was Pearl Harbor a missed opportunity for the US. Now, why do I say it's a missed opportunity? 
Well, because here's the thing. You have a huge fleet of the Japanese which is coming out. If you detect them on the way in, and frankly, intelligence could have detected them, uh, the maritime patrols could have protected them, uh, detected them, submarines, anything could have detected them. You could have turned that into a huge ambush with all the land base there you had at Pearl Harbor with the carriers, the battleships, everything. You could have turned that into the biggest ambush known to mankind and wiped out a significant portion of the Japanese fleet. And how does that change World War II? If the Japanese lose the Kido Batai in, at Pearl Harbor, they lose their fleet at Pearl Harbor. They lose the Congos at Pearl Harbor. Samuel, through deck cruisers, an age defining design or convoluted evolution. Martin Doherty, what if Gallipoli had succeeded? Martin Doherty 2, the Navy of CVA01, how would the Royal Navy in the 1970s and 2010s have differed? If they'd had CVA01. In car, the evolution of the ship and air group, the early years of HMS Furious, there seems to be a naval aviation theme running through these one suggestions. Quite a lot of them. Admiralty of the Fluff. I do love that patron name. I, I have to say that's one of my favourites. Uh, the doings and deeds of Admiral John Fisher, especially what was a bad about an all-battle cruiser year. Ooh, I can get into that one. Matthew Schrebeck, a review of US sloops, the Treasury class cutters. And Bell Nora, Naval Defence Act of 1899. You will find a link to the patron voting page down below in the description. So, I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you've enjoyed Norway, and I hope you will consider joining me on Downhill Histories from Home on Wednesday, the 18th of November 2020 at 7.30. Because if you book in, and you do have to book in advance, I think you will have a lot of fun, and I think it'll be very interesting. I'm going to be talking through the campaign, not probably in as quite as mahusive detail as I've done in this series of videos, and probably without as many what-ifs, because it is a history orientated seminar rather than a what-if consideration one. Uh, but I like counterfactual history discussions because it illuminates the history better, in that if you think about what might have been, it allows you to think about what was and why it happened, what was the reason. And I'll say why I'm going into this bit, because I've been, I was watching quite an interesting discussion last night, which was, oh, who was it? Um, but the, the, ding, dong. Uh, shared adversity, and he was talking about the Mandalorian and the reason for it's caused over um, female body armor, which, by the way, to a naval historian, someone who's paid attention to current debates, if you have women in combat, you tend to have to design the armor to fit them. But we'll leave that to one side. I thought that was basic common sense. But anyway, he was saying that instead of looking for confirmation bias, I instead of looking at evidence and looking for stuff which proves you right, look at the theories which which could prove you wrong and see if they can work. And if they can work, why can they work? And it's sort of the same when you're looking at history, when you want to analyze history. Looking at it just as how it is, is a good point. And that's definitely the point when you're writing a history book and all these things you should be doing. But when you're having a discussion or a lecture, I tend to, my policy is always to first cover the history and go through what did happen. And then say, well, look, you change this one variable and all this happens. So it tells you what, it makes you learn what's the important variables. Which matters and which doesn't. Which thing, if you change one bit, what's the difference it makes? Does it make any difference or not? 
So when you start to evaluate what's the really important things to learn, lessons to learn from this history, start to think about what are the things which, if they change, don't change the results. But if they, uh, but what things do change, do change the results. I don't know. As I said, hope you enjoyed it. And well, I now have another thing to go off and record. Take care. Have a nice day, and hope to see you tomorrow at on oh, that's the eighteenth of November, twenty twenty, at Dan Hill's History from Home. If not, I will see you on Thursday this week when we have coming up. We have two lives this coming up this week. We have the Trent Affair gone hot. How badly would it have gone for the US Navy? And on Friday, we have the Battle of Quiberon Bay. And then on... <laughs> Sunday, we have what I'm calling the random collection of books. It's just books I enjoy. Thank you very much. Take care and hope you enjoyed.